All right. Well, our topic today is advanced formatting. We've had a few sessions um, over the last year that have covered formatting. We're going to do, yeah, there might be some overlap, uh, but we've got, got some new techniques that we haven't shared that we want to talk about today. So that's what the session will be on. Um, you know, a reminder that we do the data-driven meetup once a month. It's normally kind of middle of the month on Wednesday, and all of the sessions are recorded on our YouTube page. So just on YouTube Zeo Matrix channel. Um, so following this session, that'll be posted there. But tell colleagues, tell anyone that's just interested in learning more about Tableau. We'll kind of build this, this community up. Um, what we'll do first off is just discuss the meeting format, uh, which is really simple. We'll get into that. Uh, featured speakers really are, is Jared. I'll be chiming in uh, as usual, but Jared, you'll be leading the show. Uh, the topic is advanced formatting, and then we'll leave time for a Q&A if there are questions um, following what Jared is going to share. Um, let me let a couple people in here. Uh, give me one sec. Okay. So the meeting format uh, just a reminder, we've made these these meetings completely open. So if you have questions throughout, you could definitely come off a of mute. If you want to use the chat window, you can do that too. Um, but if you're not if you're not speaking, if you could stay on mute, that would be awesome. Uh, we'll be sending out a survey post session and you know a formal Q and A at the end. But we want to make this interactive. So if you have questions uh, about something. You can type in the chat or you can come off a of mute and ask a question. And Jared is talented enough to answer that on the fly. So <laughs> yeah. I promise this, Stuart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, our featured speakers. So I've been, uh, I, I'm Stuart. I, I have been in the Tableau product for 10 years now uh, in consulting at CEO Matrix for five years. Uh, I lead our sales team. So I'm mostly working with clients uh, on their projects, but Jared, uh, most importantly, is our lead consultant. He's been in the product right about 10 years, I think, Jared, if that's correct, nine or 10 years. Um, so, about nine, yeah, about nine years. I try to ignore the time that I spent <laughs> in, in IBM Cognos as much as I can. Right, <laughs> right. Um, but, Jared, you know, for, for everyone who doesn't know, Jared's day to day job is working with Tableau, working with customers on their projects, their engagements, the puzzles that they have. So, he's seen so many things in the product um, and he is really at the center of these uh, sessions that we hold once a month so really excited that you are here again Jared. Um, our topic today is advanced formatting. These are, this is sort of a taste of what we're going to cover. Um, we're going to help you understand a bit more of the right way to build a dashboard and, and some ideas for how you could format your dashboards and really polish them up. We'll talk about you know, how you could implement, if you wanted to, custom color palettes, how you could bring in some customized branding and using logos or download buttons or using the show hide uh, feature that Tableau has. So you know, hopefully you'll learn a few things, a few tips and tricks today on, you know, how you can produce and publish really nice looking reports. That's sort of our goal uh, with this session, because uh, there's a lot of formatting that you can do in Tableau. Uh, as you've probably noticed. So that is our goal. Uh, with that, Jared, unless I missed anything, I think we are ready for a live demo and I won't share any more slides. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, we can go ahead and jump in. And cool. Stuart, I wanna start kind of at a high level. You know, We spend a lot of these okay. sessions talking about like the tips and tricks, the technical how-tos, but when it comes to formatting, a lot of this is, uh, it's it's psychological and it's philosophical, right? We're trying to take the data, the actual hard numbers, and present them in ways that clients or, you know, for the case of the folks on this call, their internal stakeholders and end users will be able to quickly see the data, interpret it, digest it, and then make an actionable decision based on that data, right? And so it this advanced formatting is really everything that comes between building the views and validating the data in Tableau and then getting to that place where we have a final presentable product, whether that's for us, for a client, or for you guys, for your internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, what have you. 
Um, I spent a lot of time before I was in consulting, treating the jobs that I was in like I was in consulting. And the way that I used to explain it to people is that if you have like a three-star Michelin restaurant with just the best steak, the best steak in the world, but your waiter trips on the way to the table and dumps that steak in your customer's lap, it does not matter how good that steak tastes, the customer is not going to have a good dinner. And with data presentation and formatting, it's the same thing. If you have all of the numbers that your stakeholders need to run the business better, to make the decisions that they need to make, but it's presented in a way that doesn't allow them to quickly get to those answers and use that data, they're just not going to have a good time. Does that make sense, Stuart? That does. That makes a lot of sense. And I also wanted to make it clear to the folks here that Jared received this workbook that I put together, a, what, a couple hours ago? So part of what's going to be fun today is to see how you work with, at this stage in Tableau, how you you know make something more presentable uh, and kind of follow your point there. Uh, so that is, uh, Jared has not had much time to prep what he's going to do, but you'll see him in real action here, uh, make this dashboard you know, really polished and, and formatted well. Yeah, I, I hopped off a call about 15 minutes ago and I pulled down these files and uh, we're going to be diving into this kind of for the first time all together. Yeah. And th this is part of the fun. I mean, I'm sure that this is, um, you know, this is not too unlike what a lot of y'all probably run into where you get a last minute request for a report or for a dashboard that the C-suite needs for a board presentation presentation on Friday and it's Wednesday afternoon and you've got to pull something together really quickly. What are the ways that we can take some raw data or some raw visualizations and just kind of clean it up a little bit and make it look a little bit more presentable. So yeah, Stuart, you, you sent over this workbook and I see we've got some sheets with some KPIs here at the top. Uh, we've got sales over time. We've got sales by state, by subcategory. Let's say a detail sheet of all of our uh, customers and the different products that they've ordered across a number of orders. We've got some filters over here on the right. So yeah, this is all the all the basic elements of a Tableau dashboard. We just want to start cleaning it up a little bit and making it look nicer. So when I look at a dashboard like this, I'm going to start the same place that we instinctually start as human beings. We're used to reading uh, in the US at least. That means we typically start top left. If you're from a country where your language starts at top right and you read right to left, then uh, maybe you're used to looking at dashboards starting in the top right. There's some interesting psychology there behind how to organize dashboards, but we're based here in, in the US as the matrix. We're gonna start looking top left and these KPIs are pretty much right where I'd want them. Uh, top and the center, nice bold numbers. They're just kind of cluttered over here on the left and they're not really spaced out the way that we might want them to. So first thing we're gonna do is just spread those out. We're gonna distribute the contents evenly. It's closer. Um, these are also using the standard fit up here at the top. So all of the the actual canvas in these sheets, we're not telling it where to go. It's just going to wherever the default is, which is usually in the left, as small as uh, Tableau can make it. So if we change that from standard to fit entire view, that's gonna start centering those a little bit more. We might even get rid of that scroll bar and we're getting closer. We could also center these titles for sales KPI, profit KPI, quantity KPI, but I'm kind of thinking we probably don't need them. We have the, the marker underneath that tells us, is it sales, profit, quantity, or orders? So I'm almost thinking we just hide that. And we let the number and the label sort of speak for itself. It's also worth mentioning that I did I did help you a little bit and I put those KPIs in a container, which is why Jared was able to fit them evenly. If they weren't in a container, 
that option would not be available. So there are other sessions we've done where we cover containers more extensively, but that is an important detail here. Yeah, so if you if you have a bunch of sheets in a container, you can click on this dropdown and it'll tell you what container it's in. So this KPI for orders is in that horizontal container. The other way to get to that is if you just double click on this little grab handle at the top, it'll highlight the container that it's in as well. A little bit of a quicker way to get there. And if, you, if you're if you brand new to Tableau, you'll start picking up pretty quickly on, um, let me go back a few steps here. If you start to see four sheets like this all grouped off to the side, you're gonna pick up and know, okay, that's in a horizontal container. It's just not distributed evenly. And you can distribute them manually too, but that gets tedious. And if you have visas that are different sizes than manually setting the size uh, can be really effective. And we might do some of that down below. So if we move down here to this next group is this, that's in a horizontal container as well. You can see that here. And if we distribute these evenly, that's not bad. Um, the, there's, I'm trying to figure out how to describe this, Stuart. Let me know how this sits with you. I feel okay. like these lines are taller than I want them. The, the okay. distribution of numbers, kind of like those deltas from month to month, hmm. it's a very spiky line. Okay. And I'm kind of wondering at the state level, if we can make that map, um, I'm going to undistribute them evenly. If we keep the map a little bit smaller, it kind of spreads that line out yeah. a little more and just makes it look less jagged. So I'm almost thinking we leave it how it was. Hmm. Just because visually, it's not as claustrophobic over here. We got a little more space between those peaks and valleys. And I think that makes it easier to, to see what's going on. It's a little bit less cluttered visually. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And then on the map, this is something where it kind of comes down to knowing, knowing your business or your company, what data you're using. If you are a company or an organization that operates a lot in the New England area up in the Northeast, you probably do not want this map view because to get down into like the Rhode Island, Massachusetts, like New Jersey area, those are some real small marks and it gets really tight up there. But if you're a West Coast company, if you're operating out in mountain time zone, you can totally see what's going on in a lot of the states where you do most of your business at this size. So that just comes down to knowing what your end users are gonna be looking for and where they're gonna be using the business most frequently. From there, there are a few things that we're gonna come back to as well. Um, I'm not in love with the like the big text titles in the upper left, the fact that we have all white backgrounds on everything. I'm debating adding some labels to this line, but maybe not all labels. So we'll come back to some of that smaller stuff. I wanna touch on this bottom third as well. Stepping back at a high level, Stuart, what you've done here, I really like having sort of three levels of this dashboard. We have our KPIs mm. that get those immediate um, takeaways. What are our sales? What's our profit? What's our quantity? How many orders? That's over the last four years, according to the order date filter. So that's great. We can adjust that as needed. And then we step down a level when we start to see, okay, what is that breakdown of sales by state? by month and year. And then we're stepping down another level. What do those sales look like by subcategory? And then even a further level to customer details. What I'm wondering is, do we really wanna scroll through this whole table of customer details on what's looking like a pretty high level dashboard? And I'm thinking, no, uh, I see we have a customer detail overview tab already built out and it looks like that's the same sheet so this is a nicer place to to kind of view this data we can see the full customer name we can see a lot more of the product name over here we're really kind of crunched down 
So instead of having this on sort of this high level sales overview dashboard, let's keep the details on the detail tab. And if we really want to get fancy with this, let's see, yeah, we can see all of our full labels here. Um, what if, what, can we just build a drill down through here? How do you feel yeah. about that? Yeah, for sure. I think that's, that'd be important to show. So, so if we use a dashboard action for that and um, let's build a filter action that runs off of this sales by subcategory, we could actually have it run off of all of these sheets. Let's take the KPIs out because that's going to be everything. So that takes out our four KPIs, but then sales by month and year by state or by subcategory, let's have that filter that customer details sheet. And if we do that, uh, let me switch that from a menu to a select. The menu's just a little bit clunky. It shows up in the tool tips. So now if we want to see all of the phones, we can click on phones. If we want to see everything in Missouri, we can see our two, our two purchases in Missouri. Is that giving us a weird glitch? There we go. Um, and same thing if we wanted to see like, what was this big spike in June 23? That one does not want to work well. Where's our, uh, is that all of our June 23? We may have had too many, there we go. Too many different overlapping filters there. But yeah, that should give us everything that we're looking for those so then we have kind of a drill through when we publish this we have the option of having these tabs available at the top um, but a lot of what we'd like to do when we're building out client dashboards is we'll build in sort of inline navigation and what i mean by that is instead of having the tabs up at the top in tableau cloud or tableau server we can uh drop a navigation button button in and use that navigation button to go back to the sales overview page. Let me see, this is in just an overall vertical container. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna remove this title because that's redundant. We already have customer detail overview up top. And then I wanna drop in a horizontal container. And let me, let me undo that real quick. That almost dropped just like here in the middle of the sheet and it wouldn't be in that vertical container if I did that when it's just the gray box it's not, not landing in the container which is not what we want if I move it up a little bit and I get that blue dashed line that's how I know it's going inside of that vertical container and then I can drop in a navigation button I'll come back to that I want to put this title next to it and here we have the same thing we had with the KPIs. I don't really want to distribute it evenly because I don't want that navigation button to take up half of the sheet. So instead, I'm going to put a blank in. Maybe I click that image instead. So a blank object is exactly what it sounds like. It's just white space that you can use to sort of pad or buffer different objects. And we can make this shorter to get our title to fit all on one line. And then our navigation button, we can format as well. A square button is fine, but we also have the option to use an image. And so for the image, I saw in the files that you sent over, we have a back button. I use that one a lot. Oh, go ahead. I, I, I use that one a lot. Let's see how it looks when we pull it out. <laughs> yeah, so so I'm going to pick that back button for the image and then in the navigate to, let's navigate back to sales overview. Yeah. It looks huge. Oh my goodness. We'll just uh, make this blank bigger. And that'll shrink down that button a little bit. And then we'll pull this back up. There we go. That's uh, it's a little bit more manageable of a size.
And then That's because cool. we're in desktop and not in cloud, we alt click and it takes us right back. So that's a really easy way to just, instead of making your end users go and look for the tabs up at the top and know which dashboard they wanna go back to, we can just have them click and they go right back. Makes it a little bit cleaner looking. You can do the same thing. Uh, I think on our advanced dashboarding session, we walked through like a left-hand menu button or maybe it was across the top, but just having different buttons for different sheets that would sort of highlight to show which sheet you're on. And that sort of inline navigation for dashboards is really clean. It's a great end user experience. When we work with clients to embed dashboards in a custom portal, that's what we tend to go with because it just makes it look like it's all seamless. And it makes a really, really comfortable user experience for the end users. So that is really helpful there. Um, getting rid of that detail sheet on the dashboard here, by the way, kind of does the opposite of what we were trying to do on that sales by month and year. On sales by month and year, we wanted to stretch the view out because it was kind of too cluttered and the there was too much variation in that month to month. It was too spiky. In sales by subcategory, I almost want the opposite. I want to see those, those big spikes because if we made this sheet super small, it makes it a little bit tougher to see the variation between some of these subcategories that are similar. Whereas when we let this breathe a little bit and stretch out along the bottom, now we can see there's a, you know, there's a difference between bookcases and appliances and there's a difference between envelopes and labels. So that helps just give a little bit more visibility to the more small differences between the values there. Some little things. Here, like Diego that. had a question. Diego, I don't know if you want to come off the mute. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you, uh, Jared. By by the way, big fan here. Just uh, of your uh, of of these sessions. I've already attended a few, so I'm I'm happy to know that you've got a few of them. But just I wanted your perspective on something here. Let's say that the sales by category section. Let's say that you only want to include the top ten. Just based on your experience, would it make sense to have zero as the lowest benchmark on that? Um, or would you kind of do something that fits the actual um, like trend and values for the charts? That's a great question because that, that gets back to sort of the psychology and the philosophy behind the visual design that, that we do when we dashboard. And if we look at the top 10 here, you know, we come down to maybe around bookcases between 100 and 120K. If we include zero, then what that means is, <clears throat> and actually let me just exclude everything uh, beyond that to illustrate what that would look like. So if we include zero, all of the space to the left of 100K kind of looks like dead space because there's nothing lower than this 115K. But if we go in and we set that axis to start at like 110, the thing that I don't love about this is that it makes it look like bookcases is super small. It makes it look like bookcases sold practically nothing next to even copiers. When in reality, there's only about 35K of difference there. And bookcases has 100K more that's kind of behind the line of where we cut off our axis. So it's one of those things that comes down to who are your end users and what do they expect to see? How are they used to digesting this data? Because if they if they're okay with seeing that axis cut off and they're going to instinctually look for the axis and see what that number is, then it can be a really effective way of like we were talking about spreading out the marks and being able to see the variations between them. What we tend to run into is that end users aren't used to seeing that. They're very, very used to seeing an axis that starts at zero. And if they see that really tiny bar, they're going to think it's practically zero. Does that help? Yes. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, absolutely. 
That's a great question. Um, we run into that a lot when we're showing labels on charts um, and the marks will be so close that they'll either overlap or they'll hide. And if you have labels that are getting hidden because they would be overlapping or you have labels that are overlapping that you don't want to, a lot of times we get this when people want to put dashboards into PowerPoint slides, we'll get asked to do things like start an axis at 100K or change an axis into like a logarithmic scale, um, things like that, or just like change all of the marks to a value of one and just put the labels on it. And when you start messing with the scale of an axis like that, it can be really confusing to end users. So we, we caution our clients to just be mindful of that. And if you wanna go that route and change the scale of an axis or set it to start at something other than zero, just be sure that that's communicated effectively to the end users and they know what to expect. And that's gonna help make sure that you don't have any confusion or mix ups with misinterpretation of the data. Thank you, Jaron, for your perspective. Yeah, for sure. That was, a, that was a really great question. I love talking about stuff like that because every, every company is different. Every data culture is different. Just like the level of data literacy amongst end users, even within a company is super variable. So those are, these are great things to think about. Um, all right, all right. There's a couple other things that I'm seeing, Stuart, that I want to try and knock out here. I'm seeing this subcategory header that's cut off because we don't have that much space over here left to the axis, but we already have sales by subcategory in the title, so we can hide that. Makes it look a little bit cleaner. Month of order date on our axis here. We already know this is sales by month and year, so I would probably just change this to say order date. And that way we know that it's by month and year of order date. And if you hover over it, we could change that tool tip too, to clean that up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we also have like sales not formatted as numbers. It's these little things that you start getting the dashboard pulled together, you put the, the Lego pieces in the right place, and then you start going back with a finer tooth comb and a finer tooth comb. Uh, let's hit a couple more high level things. This, this filter box. I would like to not have this taking up horizontal space, if at all possible. There's a couple of ways that we can do that. One would be if we throw in a horizontal container and then drop this vertical container in it. If we then remove the vertical container when this filter box is in the horizontal container, that will automatically change the distribution from vertical to horizontal. And then we can go and distribute those contents evenly again. That's one option um, just to get them up at the top and not take up that horizontal space on the right, the yeah horizontal space. The other thing we could do, um, I think you dropped a filter icon in that file as well. So I want to add a show hide button here. And much like with the navigation button, we can, we can use an image on this as opposed to text. So when this filter box is hidden, let me see if we have, yeah, we have a filter icon here. And then when it's shown, maybe we just leave it as this X. Let's see what that'll look like. So if we move this floating show hide button up to the top and make it a little bit bigger and then we can hide that filter bar and show it at the click of a button. And we can do that either with that um, container. This is in a horizontal. Yeah. So this is a vertical container inside of a horizontal. If we do it that way, it kind of pushes the content over to the left when it opens. Totally valid way to do it. We can also float this container, in which case the content is going to stay static. It's going to stay where it is. 
And if we take this floating container, give it a white background, maybe a black border, then the whole dashboard doesn't move around when we show and hide that filter box. It just pops up over the top. So that is an alternative option there. We can do the same things that we talked about before. You know, little things like this is really basic formatting, spaces in, in words and things like that. But uh, it's hard to let that stuff fly when you see it. We're getting closer, though. Uh, we talked a little also, bit. I was going to say, Jared, we, we've seen, I feel like we saw recently on a project where customer had a lot of filters, so they expose a few at the top all the time, right? Like mm -hmm. four, three, four, five, whatever. But if, when they had more, that show hide button worked really nicely to expose even more options, but it didn't take up a ton of space at the top. So that was fairly practical in that way too. Yeah, so you might have your order date filter just out at any given time. And I would want to throw that in a horizontal container and put a blank next to it so it's not quite so large. Uh, but then maybe you have, you know, your category, subcategory, state, province, et cetera, in this pop-out box because those are less commonly used. You could absolutely uh, run it like that where you have some filters exposed all the time and others that are only available um, if you click. You could even take that a step further. This is getting outside of formatting and into technical capabilities, but you could use dynamic zoning, which we've done a session on before, to control who can even view which filters based on their user group on Tableau Cloud. So if you had a group of managers that you wanted to be able to, you wanna give them the access to filter by a sales rep name, you could do that based on the manager's group, but have the individual sales rep only able to see their own data or the overall team data. And you can do that um, based on dynamic zoning. Totally off topic for formatting, but it would be a cool use case. Yeah. Stuart, what else are we thinking here? I want to do something with uh, these titles. I want to yeah, change yeah. the background to get a little bit of padding here. Yep. I got a, I might I got also a few. Mess with this map a little bit. Yeah, you wanna you wanna knock through a few? Do some well, I, here's one that I we likely overlap. It covers another session, but the at the dashboard level, putting that shading so that we have separation between sheets. Right now it's completely yeah. white background. That would be one that that jumps out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then once we have that, we can switch the background on the individual sheets mm -hmm. to include that title. And that's optional. Sometimes it's kind of neat to have the title hovering over the, the viz, but typically we'll background the sheets so the titles look like they're included in part of the sheets. Yeah. A lot of times we'll also center stuff like this. Yeah, make it a smaller font, maybe 15. It defaults to 15, so that's quite large. Yeah, and this is totally down to personal preference and your own organization's branding and style guides. I tend to use 16 for dashboard titles, 12 for viz titles. Yeah. And I mean, you could go larger or smaller, but 15 is a little bit in your face. It's probably worth calling out, Jared, that that formatting tab at the top, you can format at the workbook level. Mm -hmm. You could format, so this is gonna default, every time you open up Tableau, it defaults to Tableau book and light. You can see different variations of Tableau fonts. You could change, you could change a font across the whole workbook if you wanted to. And right, so yeah. if you have a font, uh, we use Avenir a lot. I mean, there's some really good fonts out there, right? Um, but you could change it across the whole workbook, which is really nice. Yeah, you'll want to be mindful of making sure that the font that you pick is web safe. Yeah. Um, particularly if you're planning on embedding dashboards. There's a, a relatively short list of web safe fonts. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's some more that are web safe as long as you have the font installed on your machine. 
which is kind of like why bother, but uh, you can find those lists online. If you just Google like Tableau cloud web safe fonts, you'll get a blog post or something about it. Yeah, it's a good point. Web safe for sure. Um, <clears throat> I was gonna, there was another one I was thinking off the bat. Um, oh yeah, the the grid lines. This was, <laughs> I learned this way late in the game, but right below where you are, like, you know, these these worksheets default to oh, grid yeah. lines that you could turn off across the whole workbook, mm -hmm. which uh, could save you some time. Just take some off. And that's a good way to polish up and clean stuff up. If you don't want grid lines, they're always there on specific sheets, so. Uh, that's at the format level at the top that Jared went to. Yeah, it's up here at, at Workbook. You could format the dashboard level as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. The grid lines is, that's another good point about just, again, visual design and, and how we interpret data. We tend to think if we're going to use grid lines, we won't use labels because we can already see where that point is relative to the axis. Right. But if we're getting rid of grid lines, we probably want to also get rid of the axis and include some labels to be able to better get a feel for what those numbers are. Because if we just have the um, just the marks and the axis, it's a little bit tougher to trace over mm -hmm. where some of those points are. Right. And for the line charts, there's a there's a few different ways that we can go on line charts, right? If we just show all the mark labels, it's a little bit crowded. There's a lot of numbers there. We have some additional options though that we could kind of pick through. The min and max is a fun one. This is just a good way to know what's the range of values in the view. So our lowest month was 6817 in August 2020. And the best one so far was May 2024 at 116K. Um, one of the things that we'll do with spark lines a lot is we'll do line ends and just label the end of the line. And that tells us that currently for July 24, we're at 27K. And that helps give some context to understand what some of those mm. other numbers are. You know, we know that this is pretty close to that. We know this is a lot higher. And there again, it just depends on what's the use case of the dashboard, what are the end users expecting. If this is going in a PowerPoint deck, maybe we don't want to have all of this empty line with no context and just the one mark. But if this is going to be on Tableau Cloud and you know an operations or a sales team is using this every day, if they really need to know the specific numbers, they can always hover over and get the tooltip. So there's a balance there between providing some of that data up front versus keeping it clean and allowing the end user to drill down or explore for that next level of insight on their own. Does that make sense? It does. Jared, there were a few questions that came in might be worth talking about. Um, James, hmm. I'll grab your question first. The um, This is a really good topic. So Jared, your thoughts on like a fixed, you know, the fixed dashboard size versus automatic and what you pick. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, automatic dashboard sizing is, this is like totally my personal opinion. It's a dangerous game because depending on someone's screen resolution and the size of their monitor, you can have a dashboard that looks great to you when you publish it up and you've got an angry email from you know some VP two departments over Monday morning going, I can't read the heck out of this thing. Why did this looks awful? What are you putting together just because they tried to open it up on like their nine inch iPad instead of a 15 inch MacBook. And that's where we tend to, to gravitate towards a fixed size, 1300 by 900, 1300 by 800 tends to look really good on most screens. Um, if this looks a little bit small in the canvas for y'all on the screen share. I am on like a 40 inch screen right now, but if this was on a regular like 20, 22 inch monitor, it would fill it up pretty well. And especially in Tableau Cloud, we find that this size displays really well on 
what Stuart probably nine out of 10, 19 out of 20 computers. Yeah. So we tend yeah. to gravitate towards fixed size when we're building stuff out. That's a good, good question. Um, Brendan had a good question too about uh, maybe going into more detail on formatting the map and filters. Um, I, mm. Brendan, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit more on your question uh, so Jared can can answer it effectively. Yeah, um, just general stuff, you know, as far as like if you want to change the color coding on it or you want to add mm. more data points or drill down by city cool. um, rather than just state, uh, stuff like that, you know, as far as yeah. how to get more in-depth, less in-depth. That's a yeah, it's a really good, really good question. And Jared, probably a good segue to custom color palettes using kind of some custom colors here. Uh, yeah, I'll tee you up for that. Yeah, and man, that question just made me think, do we need like a whole data-driven community session on maps? Do we do geospatial already? No, we do not. Be... We need topics, so stuff. that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. All right, so so Brendan, you're getting a cut of the the YouTube ad revenue from the geospatial session. <laughs> I don't think we make any money on that. Um, so yeah, map coloring, map formatting. There's a ton of options. Uh, if we come up here to the map menu, this background layers and map options gives us a ton of opportunity to mess around. And this is where, if I was going to be formatting this map. I've said this like three times already, and I'm going to keep coming back to it. It kind of depends on your end users because I'm looking at this and I'm saying, I don't really need like the different countries. Um, and I don't really even want like the base layers or the, um, or like the state and province borders. You might be able to turn off state and province names as well. Um, and there's probably a way if you have only US data to not show Canada and Mexico when you do that as well. But the reason that I hesitate on that is I'm thinking back to a client that we had that was in the real estate investment business. And originally we had a really clean map for them like this. And they said, actually, a lot of our investors are international. So if we could include the state, uh, like the state letters or the state names on there, that would be really helpful for them because they don't actually know where Tennessee is on a U.S. map. They don't know which one Florida is necessarily. They just know that they want their money to make money. So we say, yeah, that makes perfect sense. So there's a whole range from like really detailed to really clean. I mean, you can go in those map layers to, um, to even get like the satellite images somewhere. There's just like, uh, here we go. Yeah, so you could see like literally on a, a visual map of the earth, like a globe shot, a ton of range from super detailed to super simple and clean. And it kind of depends on what your end users are looking for. If you want to mess with the colors, we can do that. We can change this from, you know, a blue to a green or what have you. Um, you could do like an orange blue diverging. Anything you want to do is there. And then if we just look at what that looks like, it's a little bit more clean now. We don't have a lot of that background um, showing like Canada and Mexico and we don't actually do sales there. So there's a lot of options for maps um, in the map options. You can turn off some of these features. So if you want to not allow pan and zoom, you can lock the map to where it is. That's really helpful if you're using a map as a filter. You don't want people to be able to like zoom in and exclude half of the filter options by getting rid of half the map. Um, you can get rid of the search. You know, you can basically get rid of that whole view toolbar and make it super clean if you don't want people to be able to mess around with it or you can kind of leave that stuff in. So totally up to you on that. Are there any other specific map questions that you wanted to touch on before we jump over into custom color palettes? Because that is a good segue into that. Hey, Jared, real quick question for you. 
Um, mm -hmm. One issue or challenge we keep running into is trying to ingest addresses instead of lat longs. Is there a solution within Tableau that we're not aware of, or is there a, a good solution outside of Tableau that you would recommend to ingest uh, addresses into lat longs to be delivered into Tableau? Are you talking specific street level addresses? Yeah, we work with uh, individual customers and we try to put a, a spot on the map, you know, like a, a pin on the map and where they're actually located at. And a lot of that information comes in the form of an address. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, you know, I don't know of a way out of the box to convert street address into lat long in Tableau. I could have sworn that it's like ringing a bell in my head that somebody mentions something at like Tableau conference yeah. in 2019 about it. <laughs> like, I, I swear was that was recent. a feature that was coming. Yeah, I think, it, I think it is a feature. I will, I will check with the Tableau team this week because I think they were going to add that function, Riley, like natively in the product now. Um, there, there's some other tools out there that are free that will custom geocode. You could just feed it data. That's what we've columns. been doing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's what that, we have been doing. Yeah. Let me follow up and see if, if that's on the roadmap. I don't think it's out yet, um, but it was brought up recently, I believe. Yeah. I know they've talked about it and I agree. It would be a great feature to have. I was literally just working with someone on my team this morning, parsing out like a full street address field into city, state, and zip because we don't have Latin long and we can't just plug in the street address. So it would be a great feature to have. I, I think it's coming. And if we can find some info on it, we'll track you down and send you some info on it. That, that'd be fantastic. Thank you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so a couple other things that we can talk about here, Stuart, I know we've got about five, 10 minutes left. I want to touch on custom color palettes. Um, that is something in Tableau where if you go into your documents folder and go into your Tableau repository, there is a file called preferences.tps. And this is a text file in which you can enter in a custom color palette for your company's brand and colors and have that color palette available anytime you want it in Tableau. Um, so I already have this open in text edit. I think notepad would be the equivalent on a Windows machine if I'm remembering correctly from those days. And what this looks like, if you are opening it for the first time, it's just gonna have like this XML version, workbook preferences, and then slash preferences slash workbook. But when you go to plug in a custom color palette, you can name that color palette. The type is typically gonna be regular. There's a few different options you can dig into and there's some good articles on that. But then you can take the hex codes for those colors and just plug them in with color hex code slash color. And when you do that and you go to edit the colors in, um, you know, in your workbook, you'll have those different colors available as their own separate palette. There's all the different like Tableau uh, 20 and the, gosh, there's some funny ones like superficial stone and the lightning colors. You'll have that available uh, as an option, your own like company's branding and style guide. So I think I've got like 10 of them in mind right now. I haven't found a limit yet, but if you yeah. I linked in the chat window to everyone. There's, if you wanted to create custom color palette, that's the steps to do it. Um, document it from Tableau. Perfect. Yeah, it's uh, it's something that we, once you do it once, you're like, oh yeah, I could do that again anytime. And that can be a really nice way of just making your dashboards look, again, clean, in line with the rest of your company's content, especially if it's going in a PowerPoint for a presentation, or if it's an external facing dashboard, if it's going up to the executive level, having it look like it's from your company and part of your company's standard suite of reporting is like one of those little things that psychologically makes people like it better and want to use it more, just helps drive adoption. 
Well, Jared, say, um, let's say you don't have a custom palette, right? What, what would you take it if, you know, without that, right? So not going down the steps of updating the XML workbook. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you don't have a custom color palette, you can still come in here and uh, in like this color picker, you can actually use this eyedropper and like go to your company's website and just pick the color off a screen. Mm -hmm. Like if our company's color was this blue, we can just pick that blue. And now our dashboard looks like it belongs. It looks like it's from our company. So that's a really easy way. When we have clients who are like, oh, we don't really have like a branding and style guide. We have like a third party marketing agency that built our website. We don't know what the colors are. It's like, no problem. We'll just go get them. Just go grab that color with a little dropper. Super and you can you can drag it into that. So it's reusable, right, Jared? You can take that, that color and pop it in there, right? And you can use it over and over again. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that that just crashed Tableau <laughs> desktop. <I> mean, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Super that little landmine, man. What are you doing to me? <laughs> hey, we got that recorded. Oh, that's, that's great. Hilarious. Apparently that crashes Tableau. <laughs> so that's a really easy way. If you need an extra day on a dashboard, you just tell your boss, hey, Stuart and Jared crashed my workbook and I lost all of it. Let's see if autosave works. Can you pop it over? Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. I was <laughs> wondering what happened. Unexpectedly. That's okay. so funny. All right, see if I'm, sure that's open. Been, uh, I'm sure that's been fixed in the latest updated version. I'm not on. All right, well, it, right to Q&A. Uh, all right, Preston had a good question. Um, Preston, you asked about if, if you could set, like auto apply a dark mode to the whole workbook versus the default light. Um, that's a good question. I don't know if I know the answer to that, Jared. Can you do a dark mode off the bat to a whole workbook? I want to say no simply because I think I have everything possible dark moded on my computer and Tableau has not picked that up. But man, that would be nice. So workbook themes, like modern, classic. I don't see an option for a dark mode. That'd be really nice though. Yeah. We've had a couple of dashboards that we've been able to build for clients in like a pseudo dark mode, dark gray backgrounds, like nice blue and purple and yellow colors on the views and it's yeah really, really slick they look really good i don't know if anyone in the community has an answer to that we'll dig around i don't yeah i don't know that there is Preston. not as a default at least you not can build it but right right maps there's a there's a, a pretty easy dark mode on maps mm -hmm. but all right we got a couple minutes um any other questions? I could think of a couple other things we could show, but but want to leave the floor open if anyone has formatting or general questions here. I'll just be playing around with right. more questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jared, what about um I mean is there yeah, is there anything else that from a formatting that uh I don't know it jumps out at you? Um there's so some small on. things. Small things, doing. yeah. Um, you know, like if we did want to build out sort of a, a dark mode dashboard with like a really dark background, setting the opacity on these sheets to uh, to less than 100%, and then we'll have to do the same with like the actual uh, sheet background, which is in this format menu. Mm -hmm. We set that to like none. Um, that can be an option just to kind of make the dashboard look a little bit more, I don't know, intentional. Um, maybe that's not the best word for it, but that would be oh, an option. Good. There. Yeah, this is question a really question that came in from James. Yeah, is there a clever way to like, from a formatting perspective, to focus on, uh, to focus the viewer on interactivity within the dashboard so they know where to click? This is a good question. Yeah, I really like this question. Um, there are some things that you can do. One of the things, what, what, do you, what did you send me in that uh, in that folder, Stuart? Do we have like an info button in there? No, but that would be a good one. So no info. I'll use the, um, 
I use the, well, long story short, there are some things that you can do. If you have like an info button in the upper right of a viz, that's going to make an end user go, oh, I can get some more information there. Let me click on that or let me hover over that. And you can add context about the visualization. If you wanted to grab like an icon that's a mouse with a little click starburst on it, that's going to tell people just because we're used to that iconography, I should click on this view. And in like the two minutes that we have left, let me see if I can get PowerPoint pulled up because PowerPoint is the easiest, quickest way to get um, reusable icons for free. So you can just go to insert and go to icons. And let me see if we have like a click. So there's a mouse. Um, we'll use that for now because we're a little bit uh, pressed for time here. So if I just insert that, I can right click and save it as a picture. I'm gonna put that in my formatting files. Can I save that as a ping, ping or a JPEG? And now that I've done that, I can come into here and grab an image. I'm gonna float it. choose that picture that I just saved. And this, this comes into play with like end user training too, where if you tell them, hey, when you see that little mouse icon, that tells you that you can click on this and it's going to take you somewhere or it's going to do something to your dashboard. You can start to let them know this is something that's interactive. This is something you can click on. You can also do it with text. You know, you can say sales by state, and then we do that a lot. Click the filter. Yeah, that's really yeah. popular. So that's a really but, easy way to do it too. Yeah, like that used to get the point across, James. Like, and you can get fancy with it as Jared showed, which I really like. But anywhere that you have interactivity, you could have just click the filter. Something as simple as that. Um, usually hey, gets the point across. Yeah. Cool. All right. I know we're right at time. Um, I'm glad that we have your workbook crashing <laughs> recorded. It'll be up on YouTube. And I'm glad um, that it now looks really not much better than it did when we started because we've got yeah. so much else going on here now. Yes. The this, lot, this the lot is covered. Well, I hope, hope this was helpful for everyone on. Thanks so much for the time. Uh, we'll see you in a month. We'll have more uh, more topics. If you have any requests on topic areas, I think we got one, mapping maybe. Um, but we will uh, we'll see you in one month. Enjoy your summer. Enjoy working with Tableau. July. Cool. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Jared, of course, for your time here. Oh, thank you, Stuart. Always a pleasure. Yes. All right. Bye, everyone.